everybody. Aw, oh, thanks for coming back for yet another video. My name is Adrian Lee. I also go by the Wandering Art Historian. And as you know, we are talking about how to read a painting. Thanks for coming back for another video. In our last video, we talked about the origins of reading a painting. What does that really mean? Um, and the ideas behind it. We also talked about color, how important it was for artists to use color in their work and uh, conveying feelings and emotions and things of that nature, and how we argue about it, right? But we also talked about how you are already reading colors in your everyday lives. Hopefully since the last video, maybe you've been noticing more colors here and there perhaps i don't know maybe fingers crossed um in today's video we're going to talk about symbols symbols how symbols are used in art and how you already know how to read symbols you ready to get started okay awesome me too um the first big example are logos corporate logos um these are little pictures right, that are used to give you clues as to the company that is involved, that is typically trying to sell you something, right? And corporate logos are very important, especially if you are an international company, right? Because with a picture, there is no language to translate from country to country. So a visual image, a symbol, packs a lot of power. And we see these logos and symbols all the time. And I know that you know these, right? Buick, Microsoft Windows, Target, BP and Shell, Adidas, and the Olympics, right? No words, no letters, just images. Very interesting, isn't it? Um, also, when it comes to social media, we have a lot of symbols, don't we? Yeah, I know you know these. I know you know these. Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and what's this one? It's Snapchat. It's Snapchat. You don't have to use Snapchat. Don't worry about it. Um, so even in social media, we are used to using symbols to convey whatever platform we are using at that time. And if you are out there and you're saying, Adrian, I don't have time for social media, uh, I would say um, congratulations, first of all, good job. Um, but then I would say, do you have a computer at home? Because if you do, your desktop may look like this. This is not a screenshot of my desktop. Not at all. But do you notice we have all these little pictures, all these little symbols on our desktop to let us know the different programs and folders and things of that nature. And do we, do you know what we call those, those little symbols and pictures? We call them icons. Interesting. An art historical term. Hmm. Um, and even if you're like, Adrian, my desktop doesn't look like that it's all neat and tidy, then I would direct you to your smartphone because your smartphone is covered in symbols, isn't it? Yeah, look at all those symbols, all those different things you can do. The world at your fingertips. Ha! Now here's the thing, when it comes to symbols, it can be a little tricky deciphering those symbols when it comes to art. Why is that? Well, that's because there can be multiple layers to one symbol, okay? For example, let's look at this beautiful bat. I don't know if you like bats, but I love bats. I feel like they're little sky puppies that eat all the bugs, and I love them. Um, when you look at a bat, some people might feel fear. Maybe you feel scared of bats. Maybe you think of vampire bats, right? When you look at a bat, maybe you think of Halloween. It's often a symbol of Halloween, and maybe you see a bat flying out of a haunted house, perhaps, or out of a cemetery, right? Um, in the state of Florida, where we're shooting this video, um, bats are super important to our ecosystem, so you, maybe you have a very environmental uh, image in your head when it comes to a bat. Okay, right. However, what if I were to show you a simple 
black and white drawing of a bat. Would it change your interpretation of the bat or make you think of something completely unrelated? What if I showed you this? These are all bats, right? A simple bat shape in black on a white background. But I have a hunch that when you see these bats, you don't think of this, right? You don't think of the animal, the bat. Maybe, in fact, you think of Batman, right? Ha ha, the dark knight. Interesting how that works. While it is just a, because of the design of this bat, it makes us think of Batman, not necessarily the bat creature. Mm -hmm. Let me show you another way. Well, it's like Inception. There are all these different layers when it comes to symbols, right? For example, here is a t-shirt with a symbol. It's red with a circle and a lightning bolt. Now this is the symbol of a famous comic book character that you might know, The Flash, right? You might see this and say, oh, that makes me think of this comic book character, The Flash. However, when it comes to pop culture and more recent pop culture, think uh, popular sitcoms on the television, um, I want you to think about this. Is there a popular character that wears a shirt like this because of his love for this comic book character? Yes, Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory. So, while this image alone might make you think of The Flash, the comic book character, because of this character on a TV show who wears this shirt frequently because of his love for that character, it's now got another layer of symbolism because now it also represents Sheldon Cooper. We've got multiple layers of symbolism, right? Ha <laughs> ha! Didn't know that was going to happen, did you? Now here's the thing. Symbols are also very powerful in that sometimes you can tell the good guys from the bad guys by looking at their symbols. What on earth could I possibly mean by that? Well, take a look at these two pairs of symbols. Let's start with these two right here. When you look at these two symbols, can you tell which one represents the good guys, which one represents the bad guys? Now, all my pop culture lovers out there, um, I will give you clues. We got some Star Wars and we got some Marvel up here, right? Okay, so in these two images, which one's the good guys, which one's the bad guys? Well, think about this. This image here on the left is of a very strong eagle that almost looks like it is taking flight with its wings out, almost in a protective manner. And here on to the right, we have this green image of a skull with tentacles. And if you guessed that this represents the good guys, shield, and that this represents the bad guys, hydra, you are correct. Mm -hmm. Now look at these two images here. We've got two symbols related to the Star Wars universe. Do you notice the image on the left looks like a pair of wings as if they're about to take off and that image in the middle is like a star and how the image on the right feels very mechanical and very closed off. Do you notice that? So here we have um, the Rebellion and the Galactic Empire. So, uh, yeah, the Rebel Alliance. Yeah, fighting the, fighting the Empire. Hm. Good guys, bad guys. And you can tell that through their symbols. Isn't that fascinating? Good guys, bad guys. Hm. Now, symbols are also very important when we talk about superheroes. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, Ugh. Superhero movies are everywhere. They're not as important as, you know, uh, these other films, what have you. And I would beg to differ. I think superhero movies are wildly important because I feel like that's our form of modern mythology. Mm -hmm. Okay, this might be foreshadowing to a point that I make in a few minutes. But let's take a second and look at a few symbols and how they relate 
or how they relate to our favorite superheroes. So here we have this image here and we see uh, red and white stripes with a blue center and a star in the middle. And at first you might say, well, that's just a very straightforward symbol. But if I also told you it was a shield, that would give us a clue as to who it would be. This is Captain America's shield, right? It's not just anybody's shield. It's Captain America's shield, right? And then we have this beautiful image over here of a very ornate hammer, right? Mm-hmm. Now, it's not just anybody's hammer. And in this particular case, that carries a lot of weight to it, right? Because this is actually Mjolnir, Thor's hammer. And he is the only one worthy of picking up that hammer. <laughs> or is he? Hmm. Now, what's very cool is this image at the top, this symbol. Um, if you recall, um, in one of the end credit scenes, of uh, Avengers Infinity War, you will note that um, director of S.H.I.E.L.D., former director of S.H.I.E.L.D., Nick Fury drops this object onto the ground. Now at first you would say, hmm, it looks like an old-fashioned pager. And you would be right. It's got a couple of gizmos added onto it. But in the screen you also see a symbol. This is another example of how a symbol can carry quite a few layers, right? The symbol on the screen represents Captain Marvel, right? And because it is a pager, it implies that he has contacted her, right? Captain Marvel, okay. But because it is a pager, an outdated form of technology that was popular in the 80s or 90s, that is another layer of symbolism because it implies that when we get Captain Marvel's origin story, it will take place in the 1990s, which it does. Symbolism. How awesome is that, right? Okay, so if we're talking about superheroes and I said that superhero movies are kind of like modern mythology, how about we look at a piece of mythology and analyze the symbols together real quick, right? Okay, super easy, no big whoop. If you think about it, during the Renaissance, who would their superheroes be? They would be the gods and goddesses of ancient Greek, ancient Greece and ancient Rome, correct? Right? Yes, of course. So here we have a very famous painting by uh, one, of, one of my faves, uh, PPR, Peter Paul Rubens. How do we know that? Well, here's a little clue. When the ladies look very Rubenesque, mm -hmm, uh, that's how you know it's a Rubens painting. That's how we get that term. Um, so here, let's read this painting together, paying close attention to the symbols. Shall we? Yes, we shall. Let's start over here. This particular painting is titled The Judgment of Paris. Now the cool thing about mythology is that myths were used to explain the inexplicable. Basically, when humans encountered tragedy or crazy events, famine, plague, war, what have you, and there wasn't an easy explanation for them, those events, mythology was a good way to explain things away. Because you could just say, oh, it's so-and-so God getting into a fight with such-and-such -such goddess, or what have you, right? And for example, this image, the Judgment of Paris, um, details the events that lead up to what we would know as um, the Trojan War. Okay, this was painted 1632-1636, uh, and the premise of this painting is a good old-fashioned beauty pageant. I'm not even kidding, okay? The judgment of Paris is that Paris is the judge, and he has invited the three most powerful goddesses to join him in this beautiful utopian landscape to be judged on their beauty. And boy, what could go wrong, right? Yeah, 
So here we have Paris, okay? We see him in the guise of a shepherd. How do we know that? Well, he's kind of dressed down, okay? He's got a little hat here. He's got his shepherd's staff here, and he's got his faithful canine companion, a puppy hanging out with him. Now he's holding something in his hand right here. I don't know if you can tell. Can you tell it's a golden apple? Yes. That's the prize to be won if you win this incredibly kind of misogynistic beauty pageant, okay? Um, now this guy hanging out is kind of pals with Paris. And who is this individual? Well, let's look at his symbols, shall we? Um, he's got this cloak that is fluttering in the wind, bright red, so that we can see it against this beautiful landscape, right? It stands out. And it looks like he just kind of flew in, right? And it's still fluttering in the wind. He's got a hat on that has wings on either side. He's holding a stick that has snakes wrapped around it. And if you guessed that this was Mercury or Hermes, you would be correct. He is the god of commerce, travel, thus the wings on his hat, and this idea that he just happened to fly in to catch the beauty pageant. He's also, interestingly enough, the god of thieves, <laughs> and he is often a messenger for the other gods. Um, he often wears a winged hat, a winged wand with two snakes wrapped around it, has a billowing cloak, and though we can't see it in this particular depiction, he often wears winged sandals. I guess that helps him get around. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's check out our contestants in this beauty pageant, shall we? So let's start with this nice lady right here. Now we don't see her face, we see her complete backside as she is in the process of disrobing. I guess they decided to skip the um, bathing suit portion and just go right to nudity because why not, okay? Now her hair is beautifully coiffed, if you will, and this robe that she is wearing, most beautiful velvet, it feels very heavy and thick thick, like um, a wealthy person might wear, or uh, someone highly ranked in society, maybe even royalty. And if you notice, she also has this beautiful peacock at her feet. Another interesting thing, do you notice that she is right in the center of this painting? So, with all of these clues, if you guessed that this goddess was Juno, you would be correct. She is actually the chief goddess. Yes, um, she is the wife of Zeus and Jupiter, who is the chief god. Um, she is the goddess of marriage, family, and childbirth. And interestingly enough, she's associated with fidelity in marriage, which is ironic because her husband Zeus is definitely not associated with fidelity in marriage. Am I right, ladies? <laughs> um, and this symbol of the peacock is definitely seen with her very royal, very proud, very beautiful. And this we have here, Juno or Hera. Let's move to the next goddess in our beauty pageant here. Already pretty naked, right? She was just like, oh, I have to take off my clothes? No problem. Um, again, she seems to have a very beautiful cloak. Do you notice that she has a lot of really beautiful pink and red flowers in her hair? And it's very elaborately braided. Um, and um, she's got a helper. Do you see this little angel with wings? That would be a pooty, a pooty. Um, and in fact, this is Cupid, and he is helping uh, collect her garments as she discards them. And if you said, well, with these symbols here, um, that might be Venus or Aphrodite, you would also be correct. Well done, you're doing great. Um, she is the goddess of love, beauty, human fertility, and she is the mother of 
Cupid, and that's why he is hanging out collecting her clothes. One of her, uh, some of her other symbols are doves, the red rose, and she is often depicted nude in general, so I guess she had no problem with this part of the pageant, right? Now, our final contestant you will see here, um, she's kind of struggling with taking her clothes off. She's got some other issues going on here, but she has a lot of symbols with her. Um, do you notice that she's got this incredibly cool shield with a creepy woman's head on the front of it? Mm -hmm. And then down here she's got um, a beautiful helmet as if she were going to war. Mm -hmm. And then up here, we see an owl kind of peering down over her. Yeah, if you guessed that this was Minerva or Athena, you would be correct. The goddess of war associated with wisdom, thus the owl. She's often depicted with armor and a spear. Um, and in this case, her shield has the head of Medusa on it because she and Perseus uh, went and murdered Medusa. And that's her little trophy, her prize. Um, how neat is that? So here we have analyzed this painting and we've figured out our superheroes, our gods and goddesses, our three goddesses in this point. Um, and because we looked at the symbols, we could tell who was who. What is the result of the beauty pageant? Well, it's not great. It's not great. Remember how I said that uh, mythology was often used to explain terrible things that happened um, and how this was a precursor to the uh, Trojan War? Well, what happened was um, Afro uh, uh, excuse me, Juno was the most beautiful of all of the goddesses. However, it was Venus slash Aphrodite um, who did the most flirting with uh, Paris here, uh -huh. wink wink, nudge nudge. And because of her flirting, he awarded her the golden apple. That made the other goddesses quite angry and upset, which started a domino effect, bing, 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 that leads to the Trojan War. I mean, I guess that's a reason, right? Who knows? Um, thank you for uh, tuning in to this video and looking at some symbols with me. If you had fun, maybe throw me a couple of coins in my tip jar if you want. You don't have to, it's all good. If you could though, maybe share these videos with people who you think might wanna learn a little bit more about art. Um, watch them with your family, pre-screening them for the kids, of course. Um, and maybe subscribe to my YouTube channel. I don't know, if you want. Um, but I will see you next time when we dive into some repeated stories that are seen again and again um, in your everyday life, and then we'll do the parallel with art history. So thanks for tuning in, and I will definitely see you next time.